mucho tiempo, es Pete McBride, o como él solito se hace llamar Pedro McBride, eh, para apreciar, apreciar realmente la historia y el estado actual del río Colorado y su delta, hay que ser testigo de ello. Es aquí donde el trabajo de fotógrafos, cineastas y escritores es tan esencial para documentar su historia, para que comprendamos los cambios en este paisaje y cómo afecta a las plantas, los animales y las personas que viven en sus orillas. Quizá no haya nadie más conocido y respetado en esta labor que Pete McBride, fotógrafo, cineasta y escritor galardonado. Pete McBride lleva más de dos décadas estudiando el mundo con su cámara. Ha viajado por encargo a los siete continentes y a más de 75 países para las revistas National Geographic y National Geographic Traveler, Outside, Smithsonian, Esquire, Sports Illustrated y Men's Journal, entre otras. También ha hablado en algunos de los escenarios más prestigiosos del mundo, como el Foro Económico Mundial de Davos en Suiza, USAID en innumerables salas de conciertos de todo el mundo. Tras una década documentando expediciones remotas en el Everest hasta la Antártida, Pete decidió centrar su objetivo en un tema más cercano a su corazón y al nuestro, eh, que es el río Colorado, eh, básicamente en su patio trasero, porque él es originario de, de Colorado. Eh, cuatro años y 1.500 millas del río después, Pete contó la historia de un río que ya no corre su camino desde su nacimiento en lo alto de las montañas rocallosas hasta el Golfo de California, en México, eh, debido al cambio climático y a, demasiadas, a demasiados obstáculos municipales y agrícolas clavados en el camino. Pete canalizó este trabajo en un aclamado libro, tres documentales premiados y un programa de televisión de PBS del que él fue copresentador. En un proyecto reciente, Pete sustituyó el rafting por el senderismo y recorrió a pie toda la extensión del Parque Nacional del Gran Cañón, que consta de más de 700 millas sin sendero. Tras completar la travesía del Gran Cañón, Pete fue incluido en la lista de aventureros del año por National Geographic. Pete estuvo con nosotros durante el flujo pulso de 2014 y ha regresado al Delta en otras ocasiones y en los años posteriores para documentar su paisaje cambiante. Con su perspectiva personal y apasionada de la totalidad del río Colorado, nos sentimos muy honrados de dar la bienvenida a Pete a nuestro festival 2023 para que nos comparta su perspectiva. Welcome, Pete, and thank you very much for, for taking the time to be with us today. Hola, muchas gracias, muchos um, buenos días y un gran placer para, para estar aquí. Uh, voy a compartir mi screen. Um, so this might take a half second for everybody, but it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to show some of my work. I've spent the better part of two decades documenting the entire length of the Colorado River. Uh, and trying to photograph it for, to give kind of show its beauty and its challenges. Um, uh oh, this may not work, unfortunately. Pete, while well, uh, you figure out how to share your screen, just let me give one uh, quick announcement for the people who's listening. Eh, a quienes están escuchando la grabación en español, en la sección de interpretación, ustedes pueden elegir el audio original o pueden elegir traducción simultánea en español o en inglés. Thank you. Um, it's telling me I have to leave the seminar to share my screen, so I may have to leave and come back to you if that's okay. It might take one minute if everyone's got a, just a minute of patience. We can share it. Uh, we can share it for you if needed. You can share it. If you can share it, let's try that. I'm trying to share a keynote presentation. There it is. So should I play push play on my screen? No, we'll have to uh, we'll have to control it for you. But everybody can, what does everybody see? I don't know what they see. They are seeing this image. Um... Okay, I'll just, I'll just do this. We'll start at the top. And I will do my best to add some lines in Spanish where possible. And then can you control the forward and back on it? We'll just go forward. There's no, there's only one little video and we'll move quickly. Yep, looks good. So go backwards. We're 
go backwards. You're going too fast forward. Okay, go back to the beginning and we'll start on. Okie doke. Bueno, muchas gracias. Uh, era un gran placer para, para ver muchos amigos en, uh, en el región de la Delta. Um, Gaby Asveld, uh, Carlos, um, qué bien que está pasando allá. Bueno, vamos a pasar en donde, es, donde el río empiece. Um, what I'm going to do is take you on a journey from the very top of the Rocky Mountains. If you go back one slide, um, I'll tell you when to switch. Uh, this is at 12,000 feet. This is the headwaters. This is a headwater lake. Um, and this is where I live. That's my niece. She's shining a light into the reflection of the lake under the starlight. And so this is actually the birthplace of the river. And you can click the next slide. And I'll just say next, uh, Proxima. So that should play, but it doesn't look like it's activating the video. But this gives you just perspective of I'm going to take you downstream through all seven states to show how this amazing river that most people don't know that much about in the big picture. Um, covers drinking water for 40 million Americans, five and a half million acres of farmland. Um, it goes through um, 11 national parks, supports 30 Native American tribes, and of course, it goes into Mexico and supported that once great Delta. You can go next slide. And when we start at the top though, this river is challenged on many fronts, even at the beginning. So this is a 14,000 foot a range in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, not far from where I live. And you can see how the snow has turned brown, como un color de café. And this is the, from, from dust, from the polvo que viene del sureste. Uh, this is from increased development, and this is holding the sun's temperature, melting off the snow faster, letting the plants breathe and, and trans-evaporate more and longer. So we're losing, um, some say about 5%, even more of the river because of this increased runoff, faster runoff. La Próxima, next slide. Um, so this is where the river starts. You can see the mountains in the back, that's the Continental Divide. Um, and that is um, all the snowpack on the west side forms the river. Of course, there's 22 Trans Basin diversions where we take water underneath the Continental Divide and bring it to places um, on the front range like Denver and Boulder and Colorado Springs. And that water doesn't actually return to this system. It goes into the Mississippi. So we're, we're changing the river from the beginning. Next. Uh, this is, uh, we pick up um, tributary rivers like the Roaring Fork. This one's famous for fishing, recreation. Next. You can just keep your arrow ready because I'm gonna start moving quickly here. And what I've done with um, this book project I've been working on for now two decades is I tried to cover every angle of this river and how it's impacted. This is wildfire. I took this from the front door of my home in Colorado. Uh, we didn't have wildfires that often at all when I was young, but they're increasing um, throughout the whole Colorado River base. And this, this jetliner saved my town amazingly. Next. Now, irrigation, I grew up on a cattle ranch. Irrigation is one of the big straws um, of the river. We're pulling out and reusing for sprinklers and flood irrigation throughout the system for agriculture next. Much of it for hay production for cattle, um, particularly in the upper basin where there's a lot of cattle ranches. Um, next. I also looked at industry. This is a potash mine that's in Utah. We use this for uh, fertilizer. Uh, nothing against fertilizer. It just goes to show how we're using this river in many different ways. These are evaporation ponds that I diverted into the desert to get the potash. Next. And of course, there's the beauty of this river and how it has sculpted the Southwest and these, these national parks. This is Canyonlands National Park. This is just above where the Green River its longest tributary comes in and meets the Colorado River. Next. And then it comes down into Lake Powell, which is the second largest reservoir in the United States. Um, and you can see that bathtub ring, how it's been diminishing and how you can keep going. Next. And how it's it's drying up rapidly. Lake Powell two summers ago reached um, was less than a quarter full. Uh, so side canyons like this, Iceberg Canyon, have completely vanished. Next. And canyons like this, Escalante, which come in from the north, 
uh, it's fascinating because my father, when I, before I was born, walked up to this canyon, before this canyon was flooded, and he walked through this forest. And he described it as one of the most magical forests he'd ever seen. Um, this 150 foot high cottonwood forest. And so I went back and walked in my father's footsteps last summer um, and walked through what is now a ghost forest, which I find amazing and, and somewhat alarming that it's still standing. But while it's sad that this lake for the recreationists that love boating out there is disappearing and the water managers, there is a beauty of nature that is starting to come back um, and the bathtub ring is starting to wash away. Next. That's Glen Canyon Dam that, of course, forms um, Lake Powell. Um, there's big questions about hydroelectric power as the reservoir drops and gets lower and lower. How will we manage this reservoir with another great one below it, Lake Mead, which I'll get to next. Now, downstream, we have the Grand Canyon, which I've spent a lot of time at. This is a famous tributary called the Little Colorado, which comes in from the south, one of the longer tributaries. Now, there was a big development proposal to be put here on native Navajo land, but it was pushed back. But now there's actually two dam proposals on this amazing little tributary river, um, storage capacity dams. Um, I don't know if they'll ever happen, but it's amazing how people are trying to divert and store water throughout this system still. Next. And in that river lives uh, native species on the, on the river, like the humpback chub which have been swimming this river for thousands and thousands of years. They have their own challenges now with invasive spe species like um, bass, which have been introduced and are now coming in and are, are very voriciferous eaters um, and create a problem for these, these species that didn't evolve with other species like the smallmouth bass. Next. And as beautiful as the Grand Canyon is, it's 277 miles, roughly 400 kilometers of um, the Colorado River system of its 1500 miles. But I've also heard many people describe it as basically a bedrock ditch that flows 6,000 vertical feet through this canyon, down in this canyon from one giant reservoir to another. Next. But there is an amazing story of biodiversity, geology, um, and cultural history um, that is um, archaeology throughout this river system. You can see here on the right, those little lights, those are um, where people used to live. These are the ancient Puebloans, that's where they stored food. And so they've left signs of themselves throughout this canyon. Uh, and they have a lot of lessons they can teach us from their experience and how they dealt with drought and, and moving around this river system. Next. One of the tribes that I spent a lot of time with of the 30, this is the Havasupai tribe that have a reservation inside Grand Canyon. They've been protesting for years about uranium mining, which uh, many people argue is great for climate change in the future. But many people have been worried about uranium mining and contamination of the groundwater, which of course flows into the Grand Canyon and it becomes the Colorado River in our drinking water system. And so I took this photograph um, about eight years ago, and the young woman on the right, her name is Maya Talusi, her mother's behind her to the left. I, she was protesting bravely against this multinational industry, and I didn't know how we would ever see their voice get lifted high enough to make change. But just recently, next slide. You can see Maya, now age 20, standing behind President Joe Biden um, and her mother to the right in the red skirt. Um, they amazingly were able to keep on this issue and they signed a million acres, roughly a million acres into protection from future uranium mining and protecting groundwater. So there's evidence of how native voices are coming back to the table around this river and how important it is um, that we pay attention to their rights on paper, but also their voices. Next. Um, that last slide, incidentally, was brought, um, that change came about with 13 Native American tribes along the river, so it's really powerful. This image is further to the west in the Grand Canyon and shows how we, uh, on a certain level, are loving this river to death, not just for its water use, but for its beauty. Uh, this is in one day of traffic, um, the air tour industry, and I captured every photo, every helicopter that came in front of my lens, so this is 363 helicopter flights on an average Tuesday. Um, that doesn't affect the water supply directly, but it shows how 
more pressure, more tourism pressure will eventually create more demand for water as the development on the river system grows. Next. We come out of the Grand Canyon, we come into Lake Mead, that is the largest reservoir in the United States. That's Hoover Dam. You can see the white bathtub ring that represents the water we used to have. It also came down to a quarter percent full. I'm raising questions about the hydroelectric power there, um, but also just how we manage these two reservoirs. Next. On the banks of Lake Mead, you see the remnants of course, recreation and, and all sorts of detritus of this drought. Um, you also see in the upper right of this image, um, a water in tank for Las Vegas. That was one of its early straws. And it goes to show how it's complicated and expensive it is to transport Colorado River water. They have since built the third straw, which goes um, uh, underneath Lake Mead and up from the bottom. Next. Las Vegas, uh, of course, we think of as many people think of as that oasis dream that's been using water um, out of control next. But they've learned because they were never given very much water to spread it very wisely. So they're recycling water for pools from showers, et cetera. Next. Um, and they're paying people to tear out their front lawns to conserve water as they grow. So they've done a remarkable job here. Next. Not perfect, but in a good example. As you flow downstream from there, as we get heading south, um, it becomes the border of Arizona and, and California next. And you see how we have these major diversion projects, dams left and right, next. That bring water to Los Angeles, 50% of its drinking water goes 225 miles across the desert to the west here, next. And on the other side of Parker Dam, uh, the Central Arizona Project, 336 miles uphill to Phoenix and Tucson, next. Uh, Phoenix, of course, uh, has been using water not as efficiently as Las Vegas, but they're quickly realizing that they have to, next, because many developments don't have the water capacity to keep growing at the pace they have. So some water developments have been running out of water, next is fine. They recycle a lot of the water for the largest energy plant in the United States called the Palo Verde Nuclear Site, where you see Colorado River water being used here after it's cooled down the nuclear plant. Next. And then we, we move south, we start seeing the agriculture again, alfalfa production. Next. Um, throughout the river basin, um, 11, 10 to 11 cuttings on many of these fields, so very consumptive. Next. Lettuce, of course, as you come into Yuma, Arizona and all the agriculture, uh, this is 95% of basically the United States bread uh, salad bowl, lettuce, carrots, cauliflower, next, um, which is grown in the winter months. Nobody else can grow these. So we all are connected to this river, um, all of America's, and that's what I try to tell them repeatedly. Next. And you see the All-American Canal, which is one of the largest canals right at the border of um, Mexico here, um, taking over to the Imperial Valley next. A million and a half acre feet of water. Uh, much of that drainage irrigation water goes into the Salton Sea, which is depleting and, and becoming more and more contaminated as the drought continues and climate change plays its impact. You see feedlots in the foreground. So a lot of this water goes to raising cattle. Next. But amazingly, um, and a lot of it's local, but what's amazing next is a lot of the hay production, alfalfa production, as you may have heard about, has been getting exported um, overseas to Saudi Arabia and China. Um, Arizona is trying to put a lid on this, but this haystack, which is one of the largest arrays of, of hay I've ever seen, gets packaged into shipping containers and shipped back to Saudi Arabia. Um, so while we're trying to save water in one hand, we're exporting it um, across the seas to the other. Next. Morelos Dam, we're now coming into Mexico, looking into the Limitrof. Next. I remember when I came and first did this project, I'd heard about the Delta being so vast and wide and everywhere. Next. I went and tried to copy this image, which was taken in 1906, and was amazed to see that it had completely dried up. And so when I came, my first time to the Delta next, my view quickly changed. This is the end of the river as it turned, just a few miles below uh, San Luis Rio, Colorado, as it turns into this Frappuccino pit of um, froth. Next. 
And of course, the river just fizzles into nothing, um, which we all know so well. Next. And so the first time I came, I picked up my backpack and we walked the entire delta of all 90 miles thinking, next. Um, carrying my big boat and um, everything on my back thinking I might see some water, but I was amazed I never did. I walked the entire thing carrying a boat, which felt foolish at the time, next. And I was alarmed to see this is what we turned into the river, next. But what was amazing is all of you working on the river so hard and so passionately turned this next, this spot just above the bridge at Rio Colorado back to this in 2014, the first time I saw this next. And what amazed me the most about this experience was the celebration that came below the bridge here, was how everybody in Mexico came out to visit their old friend, their long lost amigo Rio Colorado next. And the horses danced and the mariachis played next. And I tried to capture the beauty of everybody suddenly catching fish again in this long lost friend, next. And I remember paddling because that's what we decided to do instead of walking, we'd paddle the river this time and we paddled down through Laguna Grande and I was just amazed um, to hear it come back to life, not only see it come back to life, but to hear it, next. And uh, one of the, Friends who joined us, Juan Butron was a wonderful guy who, um, it wasn't always easy paddling. It was very rough and very um, thick in the brush. But this sound that we heard as we passed through places like uh, Laguna Grande just shocked me because it life came back to um, the Delta so quickly. Next. Uh, we saw the river actually connect the sea through its whole channel without using irrigation canals, which perhaps would be the last time in my lifetime I would see the full river channel connect to the sea and, and, and dale al mar un beso, um, which is really remarkable to see. And it happened again recently with recent pulse flows, but of course it's getting more complicated as it's less water. Next. There's Laguna Grande. Recently I went back with Jamie Redford, which was a very magical experience. Um, he's no longer with us, sadly, but um, amazing to see how this place continues to thrive and be such an educational force to so many. Next. I went back just recently this last year and saw Juan Butron and he of course took me out to one of his favorite spots. Next. La Cienega. Uh, next. Which as all you all know, this, this area of the Delta has become a choke point for so many of these migration points. So these little areas of water are so critical for these bird species like the cinnamon teal here or the clapper rail or all these other endangered species. Next. Um, and I spent some time there at night, which was truly magical. And it reminded me that there is still hope in this story, even though the river is so challenged to go out in the stillness under the starlight and hear it the owls hooting and all those species and life like it may have been 100 or 200 or 300 years ago still exists down in a small pocket in La Cienega of what the Delta once was. Next. And so this river really is a lifeline, as we all know. It's a lifeline for um, not just the Southwest um, and, and people living in major metropolises, um, but agriculture, energy, food production, but also just, I think, our souls. Um, it is truly a magical um, living entity. Next. And so um, we'll end here. And um, I think that this, this little last bit of the Delta that still exists, and thanks to so many of you working so hard to keep it, um, is so valuable because it, it truly is the soul of, in my opinion, much of the Southwest, this river produces um, roughly 11% of the gross domestic product. And we often don't realize it. It, it really is la, la alma de, del sureste y, y, y el sangre también. Um, next. So that's the book that comes out next year that chronicles all of this two decades of work that chronicles much of the work that all of you are doing as well. And I'm so proud to um, have partnered with so many of you over the years. So, muchas gracias por todo y, um, bueno, uh, seguimos. Sí.
Thank you so much for this magical presentation. Of course, um, I'm sure we cannot capture the whole beauty of what you've seen with the naked eye through the lens, but you definitely do a very good job of showing us as close as possible what, what it must be like. Uh, too bad we don't have the sound that you heard, but uh, thank you for taking, the, taking us on this amazing journey. Um, I cannot, I don't know if people from the audience have questions, but if they do, uh, maybe we will forward them to you. And uh, for everyone who just saw the announcement of the new book, uh, hopefully we're gonna have some. So stay tuned on our social media. There may be a chance uh, to get one. So I'll thank you very one, much, Peter. One yeah. more quick comment is that um, I think it's important as we all work on protecting this river and the delta and regions that um, it many, my experience is people get very focused on one section of the river. And I try to remind people that it is one giant, enormous connective piece of, of living entity. And so try to remember that too. Muchísimas gracias, Peter, Pete, Pedro. <laughs> we, we all know you by Pedro. different names. Lo aprecio mucho. Bueno, gracias. Muchas gracias. Bueno, pues muchas gracias a, a todos por acompañarnos en esta presentación de PITS. A continuación, eh, tenemos un, un video muy especial para nosotros, eh, todos en la Alianza Revive el Río Colorado. Eh, por supuesto, amamos el río, amamos el agua, amamos los árboles, amamos a las aves y todas las especies que, que dependemos de, de él. Pero de forma muy particular, como ya escuchamos a lo largo de las distintas presentaciones de Carlos de la Parra, de mis compañeros en el campo, no puede existir la conservación del río sin la gente. Y es por eso que, que desde, los, bueno, desde hace varios años hemos trabajado muy de cerca, no solo con, con los estudiantes y la gente que visita nuestros bosques restaurados, sino también con la comunidad agrícola, con los tomadores de decisiones, tanto de México como de Estados Unidos, en los tres niveles de gobierno, y cualquier persona, eh, de las comunidades indígenas, cualquier persona que tiene que ver con el río. Entonces, eh, preparamos un pequeño video que sintetiza parte del trabajo que hemos estado haciendo durante los últimos años para hacer